Okay, great, Lucy. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks everyone for joining today. I'm very excited to have uh, an hour of your time. Uh, we have a uh, design team slash uh, engineering as well. So ask questions. Uh, if I pick up on the question while I'm presenting, I'll be happy to address it live. Um, so just ask a lot of questions. I always like that. And I learn from the audience as well. So two sentences about Sierra Circuits. So Sierra Circuits was founded in 86 uh, as a prototype uh, fabrication facility in California, the Bay Area of Silicon Valley. We have PCB fabrication and assembly, mainly doing uh, small uh, prototypes and small volume production. And then we also have a Wisconsin, Oak Creek, Wisconsin facility that's focused on uh, production quantities. So that's the two, two sentences about Sierra. And down below, you can see uh, we're a very capable uh, PCB facility and an assembly facility. Okay. That's me when I was younger. All right, so a quick overview of what we're going to be covering today. It's, it's really about stack ups. Uh, it's also about controlling your uh, crosstalk and keeping a rein on EMI. Uh, what kind of considerations you should have for choosing the materials? Uh, what, what role does that play into the manufacturing uh, side of things, especially different manufacturing tolerances? Uh, and then I think this is always popular, the difference between class two and class three is people are putting more things into space. And, uh, um, you know, there's some class two boards that really should be class three. Um, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit. And then we end with some um, example stack ups and how uh, they are being, they would be built within a factory. Okay, so we have to start with the bread and butter, right? So stack ups are really PCB stack ups are made up of cores and prepregs. And a core is basically fiberglass um, with epoxy and then copper on either side of that. And that is a C stage material where it will not uh, melt under pressure or temperature rise. So that's a core. And we buy those from the material vendors. Uh, so if you have a core that is uneven copper, let's say one ounce on one side and three ounces on another, chances are we probably don't have that core in stock and we would have to procure it from the distributor of, the, um, of that material. So cores, uh, that's the reason to understand cores and how they sit within your stack up. Second uh, stack ups are made out of prepregs, which are basically uh, B stage uh, material, B stage uh, fiberglass with uh, resin. And so B stage melts during the lamination process, which glues all the copper layers together. And so in that melting process, materials move around and shift, uh, which causes a um, registration issue. And so in order to avoid registration issues, we scale the images of each individual layer. And so how we build the board completely, the stack up and how we build it completely plays a role into how we scale it and our build strategy. So uh, that's basically, in a nutshell, if you have a complicated stack up, talk to your fabricator to understand how they're going to build it, what's the build strategy, and what kind of challenges might be faced uh, during manufacturing. There's sometimes there can be design concessions that can be made early on that really save everyone a lot of time and uh, cost. So just some quick bullet points, um, you know, as the prepreg will melt, it fills the peaks and valleys of the copper. And so if you have a heavy copper board, you would need 
probably a higher resin content or let's say more prepregs um, to fill those peaks and valleys. So you don't end up with a, any kind of resin starvation or D lamb scenario. Um, if you have heavier copper, always, uh, you know, design with wider traces and spaces. So that's in the, uh, these are a couple of considerations for heavy copper bores, let's say with, uh, you know, power applications. And if you want to minimize skin effect, you can also choose uh, copper foils that have a low, uh, low teeth, they call it. So when you're selecting your materials, you have your data sheet and then you have your manufacturing. Manufacturing is really not represented on the data sheet. So don't just pick your materials based on the electrical properties, include your fabricator to understand how that material will, is buildable. So for example, we have electrical considerations, thermal considerations, let's say calf, whether the material is calf resistance, and is that important to you? And then your mechanical strength of, of the material. One example that happened recently is that the, the board was going into a little bit higher, um, let's say a little bit more rough environment with vibration and temperature cycling. And the material chosen was, you know, completely a standard material. Well, don't do that because it's not conducive to the environment that, you know, that, um, that, you are, that you're subjecting the board to. So the reliability would be less. And if a board leaves the factory and it's electrically good, both at the PCB bare stage, as well as the assembly stage, your manufacturer kind of is done with that ownership. Now it belongs to the customer to make sure that board is reliable. So certain, certain things like material selection uh, and, and is not, it, it determines reliability over time. So any material that you pick is going to have to withstand the manufacturing process. So if you have multiple laminations, those are multiple thermal excursions. If you have assembly on top and bottom, more uh, thermal excursions. If you have um, secondary process like uh, wave solder, another thermal excursion. So does the material you pick withstand your manufacturing process? And then um, is it the right material for it to get you the reliability that you're looking for? For lead-free, we recommend a higher temp material. Um, FR406 should be okay. Um, 370HR is always better. Um, and uh, But it's not just that. Really understand all the thermal excursions your board is going to have to go through. Okay, so uh, layer layer arrangement is important as well. So just uh, as some quick examples, in the first stack of the signal layers are adjacent to each other, and that is definitely prone to crosstalk and EMI. Uh, and the ground plane is further away from the signal layers. In the second example, the clearance between the power and ground plane is very high, and there's a split in the power plane. So the third stack up is really, let's say, the best uh, would perform the best. So place signal and reference planes as close as possible together. Uh, do not place signal layers next to each other. Avoid split reference planes. Uh, couple of the power planes with ground planes for low inductance distribution. These are some of the basics. So why do you need to place signal layers close to ground planes? So just as a quick uh, bread and butter, a transmission line consists of a trace and its return path. And the image shows a strip line configuration of a transmission line with ground layers on top and bottom. When the energy is applied to the transmission line, the EM field travels through the dielectric space and flows to the neighboring copper if there's a low impedance path. 
So if this field is not regulated, it leads to signal integrity issues. So have less dielectric spacing between the ground and signal planes to reduce the impedance of your signal path. And an unbroken ground plane for microstrip helps contain the EM field. So here's another example, um, how adjacent signal layers create EMI issues. So when the EM field from layer one passes through layer two to reach the reference plane on layer three, it gets coupled with layer two EM field. This coupling can induce a common mode current, which can lead to EMI. Redesigning the stack up is the best way to avoid this. If you don't want to change the stack up, route traces orthogonally between the two layers and add copper four and ground trace on layer one, reduce the severity. So routing signals um, over a split plane will also cause signal integrity issues. If you'd like to route a signal on the power plane, make sure the trace is not passing through the split. And that's shown in the, exam in the image below. So in high-speed designs, the splits can generate spikes that lead to ground bounce and undesired voltage drops. So some advantages of placing power planes next to the ground plane. The, if the power and the ground plane are close to each other, let's say eight mils, it will act as a high frequency capacitor. So it creates the low impedance uh, distribution network for power and ground connections. And it helps in reducing EMI when signal is transitioning from the layers. And so other power plane considerations, place two adjacent power planes as far as possible to avoid unwanted Coupling at a reference plane near the power plane to give a low inductance path and do not route the signal layer between the ground and power as it creates coupling issues. So here's some best practices for a layer transition uh, through vias. Uh, so if you minimize the size and the number of vias, this will reduce the risk of impedance mismatch. You can also employ back drilling to you know, avoid the stub reflection. And back drilling is a, should be a widely used technique uh, if it can eliminate additional laminations. So uh, if your tra via transitions between two ground planes, use ground via with signal via as shown in the image. If your via transitions between power and ground planes, place a decoupling capacitor at the transition point as shown here. So some essential stack up design techniques, um, balance the copper, copper weight between the signal layer and the ground power layer across the stack up. Um, so there's something called symmetrical and there's something called balanced. And internally, we have a lot of discussions on that. Um, you know, if you have a sub, you can still have a balanced construction, even if they're, uh, the subs are different layer counts. So, you know, it's again, it's about asking your supplier if they're gonna build in subs or if they need to build in subs, if those are balanced subs or if the total stack up would be end up being balanced or do they have any concerns about that? The reason that's important is not just for manufacturing the bare board, but also in the end, you could induce some assembly defects by not having, um, let's say a flat uh, circuit board. And then some more electrical considerations your stack ups. So we're going to switch to a quick demo um, of our signal and plane layer estimator. So before, the reason why this is important in your design process, before you start the layout, you know, you can estimate how many layers you would possibly need for this design. And that then allows you to come up with a stack up that you can design into rather than designing and then having to make changes to your stack up um, at the last at the last minute. So can I uh, hand it over to the design team to uh, demo this? Several algor algorithms have been published and become well known for the estimation of uh, PCB signal and plane layer. Uh, Sierra circuit signal and plane layer estimator uses this algorithm to calculate the minimum number of signal plane layers required to accomplish 
all the interconnections in a PCB layout. The illustration defines the input parameters for better understanding. For example, this uh, wiring channel width, it is the distance between two vias, which can be used for routing of the traces. Uh, you can change the units. The default is mils, but you can change it into inches, millimeter, micrometer, and centimeter. For the estimated number of signal and plane layers, you need to enter the width of the PCB. Uh, for example, let us enter two inches, the PCB length, enter the total number of component pins, the wiring channel width, 100 mils, the via pad diameter as 20 mils, and the trace or space width is 5 mils. You can click on calculate, and we can see that the tool suggests four signal layers and four plane layers. Apart from the signal and the plane layers, the tool also displays the PCB area, the estimated number of nets, and the net density. We can go over to the slides now. Okay, thanks, Malala. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. So we're going to jump into some HDI uh, stack up designs. So these are the basics um, that IPC recommends. Um, so zero and zero is no, no sequential lamination, no berry vias. A one and one, one sequential lamination with a berry via, and two and two, two, two sequential laminations. So really, um, HDI stack ups in order to be uh, with sequential lamination, they really should be balanced from the center out. And so that's what uh, the two and two uh, shows uh, down below. Now, uh, when you're choosing the material, that again, I mentioned this before, but if it's going through multiple laminations, you have to make sure it can withstand that, those thermal cycles. And uh, you also need to, or I would say the fabricator needs to make sure that based on the design, there's the right uh, prepreg glass styles, thicknesses um, that support your microvia size. And another thing that we do is, to, is we try and dial in the impedance. So we might need to change the thicknesses a little bit, which might change the aspect ratio of filling those vias or plating those microvias, um, which would always result in us feeding back to you uh, for an approval of the uh, stack up uh, thickness change. So a PCB stack up isn't just doesn't just live by itself. It also has a lot to do with the aspect ratio of microvias and uh, through hole vias. So that has to be consideration. So for example, in that sub uh, in the two and two, what's the drill size that you're using and is it at least um, you know, 10 to one or is it 12 to one where uh, it's easy to plate and possibly fill that via either with um, the resin that would flow in there or a uh, non-conductive epoxy. So those are considerations, aspect ratio considerations for the sub as well um, and stack up considerations for the sub. Uh, so this is an example stack up, um, again, HDI, and I just wanted to go through real quick how we would build it. So we would first start with um, layers 4 through 13. We would, um, you know, go through the basic inner layer processes, which is, you know, imaging, uh, develop edge strip, AOI, um, and then we would laminate that. Uh, and like a regular, you know, circuit board, and we would have to mechanically drill that, and you know, starting from starting from the very beginning, these types of designs are really dependent on does the fabricator have a good scaling uh, mechanism in place in their facility uh, to get the registration right. So. At Sierra, everything is optimized for scaling. We use LDI on 100% of our 
uh, inner layers in our boards, and, and we have a scaling system that you know optimizes the image based on you know that stack up and that build. Uh, by stack up, I mean material choice and copper weight. And so, in some cases, when there's very special designs, um, our scaling doesn't have a, the the right information in the database because we just haven't built that before. So, in those cases, we would uh, opt to build a first article. And so, a first article is you're running the the board up to a certain point to collect the scaling information. Uh, that you can use. So you're measuring press out thickness uh, between copper uh, copper layers. You're measuring the movement of the material, and you know where the next uh, build, which would be the actual build, would you benefit from that first article and what we learned from the first article. So that's really the sub. And then in sequential lamb, after we do the sub, manufacture the sub, we would go through the lamination process again, and then we would laser the next pair of blind vias from uh, 14 to 13 um, and uh, three to four. So those are, and then we would copper fill it. Uh, if it's staggered, then we don't have to completely fill that via with copper, um, which is a better, better design for manufacturing. This is some cross sections of what uh, laser drill microvia looks like. The image on the bottom is stacked. And so that copper pillar can cause lots of um, pain, especially if you're if you need IST coupons, uh, because most of the failure mode happens to be uh, with stacked vias. With the staggered vias, like in the image above, there's more, um, let's say, um, flexibility or leeway within the stack up. It's not one big, you know, copper uh, feature. And so that helps with the, um, let's say, Z axis expansion and maintaining proper uh, via integrity. Uh, so I would recommend always staggering your vias rather than stacking them if your design allows for that. So that was the quick overview on HDI uh, stack ups. We also have an HDI DFM guide, which has a lot more information. And you can always reach out and ask us any questions that you have about HDI, uh, as well as use our stack up planner, which we'll probably be demoing. So moving on to rigid flex stack ups and material selection. So for rigid flex, um, you know, the key thing, the basics of a rigid flex is you have a cover lay layer to protect the flex section and provide insulation. Uh, we're using adhesives as well and stiffeners. And stiffeners are just, um, you know, basically cores with no copper. Um, those are the most common stiffener types. So those are the material types used in uh, rigid flex uh, stack ups. So for material considerations, avoid combining in incompatible materials with different CTEs. That's true for any design and select layer thicknesses that maintain flexibility, but also provide sufficient mechanical strength. So if your flex board, if the flex section of your rigid flex or your flex board in general needs to flex, you know, make sure that it actually can flex. Um, don't add too much copper, don't add too many layers. Um, use a crosshatch copper pattern uh, to provide more of the flexibility. So, Some quick design considerations for effective uh, rigid flex stack ups. You know, place the flex layers within the middle of the stack up to protect the flex to protect the flex uh, during manufacturing process. And the flex section, um, there are other manufacturers that can make flex on the outer layer, um, but for us at Sierra, that's a let's say a process decision that we don't do those types of uh, stack ups. And I think it's less um, 
less reliable in my opinion, but there are other fabricators that would do that. And the stack ups for the rigid sections really should be identical um, in terms of thicknesses to, and even and even cores and prepregs in order to, you know, ease the manufacturing process of a rigid flex uh, board. Uh, you need to place the vias away from the transition point. Uh, so you allow enough uh, space for the no flow prepreg to actually flow a little bit, uh, but at the same time not uh, spill out onto the flex area, which would reduce your uh, bend radius. So you definitely want to avoid, uh, you know, sharp, sharp bends, um, and uh, you want to route your traces differently as well. And no sharp uh, angles in your routing. So these are some of the basics for um, rigid flex. For high speed designs or, or you know high speed stack ups, you definitely want to go with low loss materials. And so um, you know what does that mean? Well, that's you're making a decision based on electrical properties, but at the same time, I hope one takeaway from this is. You cannot just make your decisions based on the electrical properties. You also have to understand the manufacturability. So for example, here, the Rogers 4350 is less conducive to sequential lamination builds, uh, whereas the Megatron is very common use is uh, sequential lamination, high speed, high density types of designs. Uh, so both materials have their advantages and uh, drawbacks. Uh, the other comment is that you can pick materials with, you know, tighter and denser weaves. That has an impact on, um, you know, drilling and, you know, being able to provide class three requirements like minimize wicking and providing a proper etch back, um, you know, and it also plays a role with your, you know, your signals as they go across the knuckles uh, in the in the weave the the effectiveness or the 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 material electrical properties of the material does change so you know i i'll never forget this one example where we uh, provided a board which had a very good material and um, minimized any of this effect and and the boards performed well uh, when the customer went to a different fabricator, that fabricator used a different set of materials that they were used to, and um, the, the boards didn't perform uh, as well anymore. And it was primarily because of uh, nothing in the design changed. It was really this, this kind of effect that happens because of the, the weave. So please keep, a, keep an eye out on that. Okay, so there's also options for hybrid stackups. So a hybrid basically for a fabricator, all it means is that we really need to have a better understanding of how the materials are gonna move and go back to a proper scaling prior to manufacturing as I was discussing to, uh, before. Um, the pros of course are a full Rogers stackup would be more expensive than just having let's say an outer layer core uh, be built with Rogers and the rest, let's say 370 HR. So totally fine. You just have to know about how things are going to scale and, and if the materials are um, able to be combined together, right? And then the uh, the other areas it affects is drilling and, um, you know, you have to come up with a kind of a hybrid plasma cycle as well to clean out the holes. So I think we're now at the stack up uh, tool um, demo. A PCV stackup designer tool uh, provides manufacturable and cost optimized stackups and also includes an impedance calculator. The tool allows you to change the signal plane combination and the copper weights in the generated stackup. Uh, first, you need to enter the board information uh, like the project name. Uh, for example, demo, a revision number, PCB size, uh, a two by two inch maybe, uh, target PCB thickness can be chosen from the drop down. 
you can choose a PCB material from the list available, or you can click on the material selector compare guide. Uh, this guide will provide you with data sheets uh, from which you can compare the attributes of the materials. Once the board information is filled in, uh, you need to choose one of the listed design approaches in the stack up design section. You can choose the first option or if you know the number of layers required in your design. If you have a complex BGA that dictates the number of signal planes uh, in your board, uh, you can choose the second option. Uh, let us go with option one. Enter the layer count, for example, eight and a signal plane layer combination. Click on run stack up designer. You will be presented with the Sierra circuits recommended stack ups. Uh, this table gives the stack up information uh, like the signal plane layers, uh, the standard or HDI uh, stack up, the number of sequential laminations, uh, the PCB thickness and the technology level and code index. Uh, you can click on the help index for a description of the corresponding parameter. Uh, the help content for uh, STD or HDI, for example, shows the illustrations of the standard and the different HDI stackups. The standard stackups only allows through hole vias, uh, whereas the HDI stackups also allows the buried and blind wheels. The technology level for a stackup uh, defines the drill size, pad size, and the trace width parameters that can be used. The features of the technology level are finer as you go from level one to level three. The cost index gives you a relative idea of what it would be to compare another stack up. Uh, you can use all of this information to choose a stack up that resembles your final build up. Uh, let us go with option A and click on report. Here on the report page, you can view the attributes without going back to the previous page. If you do any changes uh, to the board uh, information, then please make sure to click on generate custom stack up uh, to update. If you scroll down, you see a detailed construction of the clo uh, chosen stack up. Uh, information like the material, layer type, copper percentage, the finished thickness in mills, the dielectric or copper based thickness, the copper plating thickness, the dielectric description, the dielectric constant and the material construction details are given. Uh, here you can change the signal or plane layer combination. Uh, for example, I change the signal layer to mixed layer in layer three, and we can see that the copper percentage is also automatically adjusted. Similarly, I can change it at layer six and make it a symmetrical uh, stack up. You can scroll further down and you can view that we have a Sierra circuits built in impedance calculator. This will allow you or uh, to add controlled impedance and compute the trace width and trace spacing for a target impedance. Uh, you can also remove the solder mask layer by clicking on the cross symbol at the layer number column. Let us take a few examples for the impedance calculator. You can click on the plus sign and this will add a fresh line to the impedance table. Uh, for signal layer one and the target impedance of 50, I choose a model type of single ended and I click two for the first reference layer. The transmission line model is the uncoated microstrip single ended. Similarly, I can take more layers. For example, in a signal layer one, I can take a target impedance of 100. Uh, differential pair is my model. Two again for the reference layer and an uncoated microstrip in differential pair will be available. Uh, Another example will be a uh, signal layer three with a target impedance 50 and a model type of single ended. Reference layer one, I will be selecting as two and four for reference layer two. Here we see that we have a strip line single ended for the transmission line model. You can click on calculate or calculate all impedances. The trace width, calculate impedance, calculate and the propagation delay is calculated and displayed. Uh, if you wish to see more parameters, then you can click on view and it will take us to our impedance calculator where more parameters uh, will be displayed, calculated and displayed. For example, the inductance, the capacitance and the effective dielectric constant. 
Uh, we also have the technology parameters, cost index, and the VSF information available here. Uh, click on save, and this will uh, and download the IPC standard. Uh, download it in IPC standard two five eight one. Uh, so clicking on save generates an ID that allows you to access the stack up in the next login sessions too. If you click on export to IPC 2581, the stack up data is imported in a .xml file, which can be implemented to any ECAT tool, which is supported, uh, which supports IPC 2581. Uh, you can also alternatively use a second stack up design method, which involves the VGA. Start by adding the project name the revision number and the other board uh, details and the second option. The recommended BGA patterns are displayed below. You can enter the pins here for the XY direction and the YY direction and the BGA pitch as suppose 0 0.8 mm. Uh, this shows how many faces can be uh, routed between the adjacent BGA pads and vias in different layers. The drill and pad sizes to be used under and outside the BGA area is also shown. So click on run stackup designer and follow the same procedure as earlier. The stackups that are suggested here will support your BGA. You can also click on this view saved stackups to view all your previous uh, saved uh, stack ups. Thank you so much. That was my time. Thanks, Nandana. Uh, let me share my screen again. Yeah, so the stack of tools is pretty fantastic, in my opinion, and we're uh, constantly making it better. And you also have an IPC 2581 um, download uh, of the stack up. So it'll be less data entry at the very least on your end. Um, and then of course the other benefits are better electrical performance um, already kind of built into uh, the stack, what the stack up tool recommends as well as manufacturability. So there's a lot of reasons to, um, you know, play around with the stack up tool. Uh, we do get a lot of stack ups that just really aren't, let's say, manufacturable. So, uh, you know, no matter how experienced you are, it uh, doesn't hurt. All right, let me go to the next slide. Okay, so. In manufacturing, there's always tolerances. Um, and unfortunately, those tolerances don't just live in isolation. They also play on each other. So what does that mean? Like we talked a little bit about uh, aspect ratio for the via, right? So if the aspect ratio of the via um, is, uh, you know, not conducive to our manufacturing, you're not going to get a well-plated uh, whole wall, or you might get something that looks like an hourglass uh, when you cross-section your via. But that um, aspect ratio changes as the thickness of the board changes um, and the size of the via changes because it's really about the throwing power of the plating bath. So 10 to 1 versus 16 to, or let's say 15 to one, if the via is getting bigger, maybe 15 to one is okay. But if the via is really tiny, then maybe a 10 to one is really the best aspect ratio we would want to uh, manufacture. Also, the uh, non-conductive fill processes have their own aspect ratio limitations. So if you look on someone's website and they can, and they say aspect ratio, you know, that we can do standard 12 to one, it really depends as well. So unfortunately, tolerances always kind of play, play around with each other. And that's why it's good to have like a kickoff meeting with your fabricator, you know, have a quick Zoom call or discuss the manufacturing issues or concerns that could happen. Um, so thickness tolerances are there. Um, and again, as the board thickness varies, the tolerances or what's available in terms of tolerance control will also change. 
Um, layer to layer registration uh, is going to be different based on the sub LAM requirements um, and the copper weights um, and the glass styles chosen. So all these really play a role in terms of uh, manufacturing tolerances. The bottom line is talk to your fabricator. Even for something simple as an aspect ratio uh, kind of a tolerance. Uh, here's a quick overview of class two versus class three. And just a quick comment. Um, on uh, class two versus class three, uh, you can have some, you can kind of have a, uh, a middle ground, which, which uh, you know, goes both ways. So let's say you have a class two board, but you want extra reliability. So you want something like etch back. You can add a fab note that says, you know, this board is class two, but, you know, we also want etch back on this, uh, you know, in the vias for better um, whole, whole integrity. So that's an example. Or for a class three board, maybe, you know, you want to know, hey, am I designing to class three, but I'm really gonna build a class two today, but I wanna know if I've designed a class three uh, and then all these issues might come out, which you can then subsequently waive. Um, you know, things like maybe you have an annular ring issue or, you know, some other design constraint that doesn't really equal class three. So you're effectively waiving those parts of the class three just to know what was designed that doesn't meet the class three uh, requirement. And that's pretty pop common at, at the uh, prototype stage to, uh, to wanna do. So here's some example uh, fab notes. Uh, this is kind of an eyesore, uh, but uh, this is the basics. Uh, and then we kind of tried to make it a little bit bigger on subsequent uh, slides. Now, one common thing that we catch in our on hold process, or you could say our DFM and CAM process is that, you know, what's in the data, like in terms of drill charts, doesn't match the drill chart and the fab drawing. Um, to always double check that uh, your fab drawing once your final set of data is, is done. Also for stack ups, um, you know, I would recommend not to over specify materials based on electrical performance. So for example, you can go down to the level of picking resin percentage and glass cloth styles. But then if you also have a fabrication note that talks about overall thicknesses and overall tolerances, and you have impedance requirements, you're effectively boxing in your fabricator um, to not be able to achieve what you're looking for because you're specifying certain um, plies of prepreg and glass cloth styles that, you know, really leave that to your fabricator. You don't need to be the one doing that. That's what the fabricator is there for. And, and most fabricators have years of experience, you know, picking the right materials for manufacturability. Okay. And that would vary a little bit from fabricator to fabricator. So still not super important for, for you to, you know, be in control over. So that's my advice there, not to box your fabricator in based on some fab, fab notes. So um, here's an example of a little more zoomed in example of the PCB stack up. And here's some fabrication notes. I think the most important thing on fab notes is to really call out things that are important to you or special. So for example, if you have an application that's in a vacuum or going to space, um, having the no outgassing notes would be very helpful. Um, you know, if it's if the data is sensitive, I would put, you know, kind of ITAR markings or EAR markings on there. Um, you don't need redundant fab notes. Um, if you're calling out a spec like a class three spec, 
then you know we're going to follow class three spec as well as anyone else so there's really no need for redundant uh, fab notes there um, those are some of the uh, general comments uh, we have a great uh, knowledge base section on our website that helps you outline the the fab notes if you need help with what should the exact wording of the fab note be and then also if you have a question always talk to us because every design is unique and different so one fab note on one drawing would could mean could impact the overall design completely differently on a different design so don't copy and paste fab notes not a good practice so uh, lastly how do we know that we've done a good job for you on the pcb level uh, we go through our cross section, which basically is we take the, the model that we're going to start with uh, in planning in terms of materials, press out thicknesses, copper weights, et cetera, et cetera. And then we measure the results of that um, with a cross section. So, you know, things that you wouldn't expect play a role. So, for example, in a class three board, you have a certain amount of copper requirement let's say on the outer layer. Um, and if you have sub lambs that all are impacting the outer layer, um, the design becomes, uh, becomes a little bit more difficult to manufacture. And then let's say you have a hassle surface finish, well, hassle also impacts copper weights. So all these things play together uh, in terms of our modeling. And then we have to measure the final manufacturing. Did we actually hit those results? Um, and some designs are more difficult than others. So we do find that, hey, we're out of spec or out of tolerance on this design and that we capture that internally. And if it's a design feedback that we can give to a customer, we would absolutely do that. Uh, we believe in uh, transparency. So that's, uh, I think that covers the presentation. Oh, no, I got more. So cost drivers uh, are also super critical. The stack up does play a role. And in prototyping, I would say the number of process steps really plays a role there. Um, so the number of laminations, uh, number of sub lamps. So having different via structures, those are what really cause the increase in number of laminations. Um, so, so even if you don't know how the board is gonna be built, just knowing that you're adding buried vias will cause um, a cost increase uh, if it results into, you know, multiple laminations, right? So that's a key thing to consider. It also increases time. Uh, so if you're in your prototype stage and you have a critical deadline, uh, see if you can talk to the fabricator and they can use different build strategies to reduce the number of laminations. I mentioned back drill earlier. Back drill can be used to alleviate uh, multiple laminations. So Talk to your fabricator about that. And that and that's basically the build strategy to reduce uh, cycle time. And then in, in high volume production, I think it, the priorities change, right? So our factory in Sunnyvale that focuses on low volume will have different considerations than our factory in Wisconsin in terms of what's going to drive up the cost. Um, you know, definitely material becomes a bigger percentage of the overall cost um, and then, then, it, then it is in uh, prototyping. And there was a question in terms of, you know, can we add layer counts, you know, if we're not concerned with cost to get the most reliable um, electrically, you know, let's say uh, performing the highest electrical performance as well as the most reliable kind of overall circuit board. And, you know, yes, if you're not concerned about adding uh, layer pairs, you're totally fine, but then make sure that the aspect ratio is something that's manufacturable. You don't want to add a potential, uh, you know, root cause uh, issue later on uh, of reliability because the aspect ratio kind of went a little bit outside of normal for that fabricator. Um, so all these things still play together and you can't just uh, make one decision uh, unilaterally. You know, one of, the, uh, one of the best things I would say is that our, our current customers, you know, our best current customers are really involving us early up front. 
in material selection, stack of design, build strategy, um, and uh, you know all that basically results in a better uh, better circuit board for you for you guys. So I would highly recommend that you engage as early on, even uh, prior to you know laying laying out the first uh, track. Uh, that's when that's when we can make the most impact for the best uh, design possible, and that's why we're here. And uh, also pointing to our fantastic um, website with all the free tools, as well as the knowledge base, base articles and the design guides if you want to dig deep into something, uh, and our uh, blog articles. Uh, all really good stuff that our engineers have worked hard on to uh, get that information to you uh, as um, easily as possible for you to digest. So really that's it uh, for today. Um, unless there's any uh, questions, we should be happy to answer any questions. Um, there's one question about, you know, building to class two versus class three. So all of our equipment in our facility is the same. And so every board that we build class two or class three or HDI or not standard, will go through the same equipment. And so you're getting the benefit of that, whether you have a tough design or a standard design. And so that also kind of plays into a, a certain amount of fixed costs we do have. Uh, and then, you know, how do we build a class two versus a class three? Um, you know, uh, Mark asked a question, and he's absolutely right. Really, it has to do with, you know, inspecting the boards. Did we meet that spec that class three has versus a class two? So one quick example is for class two versus class three. In class two, you're allowed breakout, which means your drill can break outside of the pad. And so we won't reject those boards. We will inspect to class two. It's still built on the same machines and maybe the design that you did doesn't have enough annular ring for class three, which is also okay. It, there was a breakout, but that's totally acceptable in a class two uh, environment. In a class three environment, um, you would have to design your annular ring to meet that um, spec. And uh, same with assembly. Uh, I know this webinar was not about assembly, but just as a quick pointer, class two assembled boards, you know, really leave it up to the fabricator to allow for touch up, hand touch up, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas class three is much more stringent on the uh, steps for rework and um, how you how you would build it in assembly as well. So I would say class two and class three, although it is a spec, it's not just a final check. It is. It does change your design, and it does change our manufacturing uh, traveler steps, uh, both in fabrication and assembly, to finally meet the spec at the end. So I hope that answers your question. It was a great question. All right. Well, thank you guys very much. Uh, have a great rest of your day, and uh, please give us an opportunity to quote your next design. We would love to be added as a vendor to your uh, vendor list. Uh, thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you.